And I'd like to welcome our next guest, uh, Jeremy Weir, the uh, executive chairman of Trafigura. Jeremy, welcome. Thank you, Neil. So I want to start with a question that I'm going to ask throughout the summit. I mean, it's the main theme. Do you think we are in a commodity super cycle? Or do you think the rebound that we've seen in commodity prices over the past year, which has been very strong, is just a cyclical recovery? We are obviously seeing, you know, as you said, elevated prices. Uh, we think on a long-term basis, we are going to see you know, sustained higher prices. In the short term, it may have got a little bit ahead of ourselves. We've had you know, issues around uh, you know, supply chains, civil supply routes, uh, inefficiencies, inefficiencies in the system. And that ultimately has re resulted in people wanting to have more work inventory. And as a result of that, we've seen you know, a, a rapid price movement in the last, particularly in the last sort of uh, you know, six months. Uh, but that we may see a small setback potentially, but on a long-term basis, as we see this energy transition taking place, we, we are going to see continued demand for commodities. Uh, it's metal intensive particularly, mm -hmm. and therefore within that environment, uh, I do expect to see you know, sustained prices at these levels and higher. Okay, so you think the structural drivers really are there for a period of prolonged yeah, commodity price strength then? I do. I do very much so. And why? Because, you know, as we, we've seen a lot of stimulative packages associated with this energy transition, this is infrastructure intensive. Um, and we're already starting to see that actually you know, the funds being released in Europe. And uh, through that, we expect to see strong demand continuing in our business uh, for a prolonged period of time. And as a result, you know, it's highly metal intensive, um, if you like, what this, uh, this infrastructure spend is going to be. And we need to be able to you know, have these metals available for it. So, yes, um, it's going to be a very interesting time over the next... You know, it's not short-term, by the way, mm -hmm. Neil. This is typically the commodity cycles have been one where you have, you know, a year of a great excitement and then the whole thing collapses again. This seems, seems very different to us and it's prolonged and it's going to be for a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned metals there and clearly they're going to play a big part in the transition, EVs, solar, renewables, etc. But what about oil? Can oil join in this super cycle as well? Oil's got very different dynamics. I think one thing's for certain, you know, everyone, you know, if you like, wants to wants to decarbonise and as a result of that, you know, are we going to need oil in the short term? The fact that from our point of view, we think oil has is going to be around for quite a long time. Uh, it's going to have a long tail. But one of the issues on oil is actually not so much on the demand side. Uh, remember, we got down to, even during the, sort of the peak of the COVID crisis, we were still consuming 80 million barrels of oil a day. Now we're back up to sort of the, the, the mid to low 90s uh, million barrels of oil today. So it has recovered quite strongly. But most importantly, you know, the supply situation is getting quite uh, concerning. We've gone from, if you like, 15 years of reserves down to 10 years of reserves. And we've seen capital expenditure on oil go from, you know, let's say five, five years ago, six years ago, from sort of north of $400 billion a year. Uh, to just over $100 billion a year. So therefore, there's a concern, I think, that on the supply side, which will probably drive prices higher. So could we see $100 oil again because of this lack of investment? I mean, I think you were at the St. Petersburg summit last week and Correct. Igor Sechin was making, of Rosneft was making this point about the lack of investment in the industry. And we see pretty much every day headlines about big oil companies being told, you know, not to invest by activists. And indeed, we've, we've seen Shell sort of back down uh, as well last week in terms of cutting its emissions. So, I mean, do you think a sort of a last spike in the oil price is possible before demand does start to plateau and decline because of the, the transition? I think you know it depends what, you, what over what period you think the price what the spike's going to take place. I actually think that there is a chance for oil to get up to those numbers um, because you know you need higher prices to incentivize. It, it also maybe depend on the cost of carbon in the future as well. You need to attract capital to the business, and the fact is that you know as, we, as on a forward-looking basis, the likelihood of capital availability for the industry and the cost of capital for the industry will be higher. So therefore, I think there's a, there is a chance we, we get up to those price levels. Well, do you think there's a risk that we're going to head for a disorderly energy transition? I mean, I, I mentioned there Shell. I mean, obviously, a Dutch court's told it to cut emissions. The IEA recently come out with a report saying no new oil and gas developments. We've seen activists put on the board at Exxon. I mean, do you think there's, there's a risk that things are turning anti-fossil fuel and as a result, we see a disorderly energy transition with the result that prices could spike, inflation could flare up? I mean, is that a real possibility? Is there something you're, you're concerned about? 
the rhetoric has definitely changed. You know, it is very much focused on decarbonisation and, uh, and through that the debate's becoming sort of quite active, shall we say. I think one of the, the important things is that we have we, we are in a transition mode. Um, it would, I would like to see it be responsible over a period of time. You know, we've got emerging markets which rely on hydrocarbons to, to, to create value and wealth and prosperity for people. Uh, we, we, need, we do need the oil uh, and we do need energy. Um, and there's a risk if we take a, a very sort of severe view on, on life and want to wind down hydrocarbons very, very quickly because we're not ready yet for the, for the transition to take place for electrification across the globe. Uh, did we turn the lights out? Now, that could be absolutely catastrophic. So we just need to have a rational debate about this, uh, this topic and recognise that we just can't sort of turn the switch and go from one sector uh, you know, to another sector overnight. It's going to take a serious amount of investment, a serious amount of time and a serious amount of technology. Mm. And, of course, the risk is, I mean, if we do see a, a spike in, say, oil prices to 100, I mean, it's, it's the poorest parts of the world that, that will suffer in that, in, in that context. Correct, um, but also remember some of these 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 countries require oil production for their own wealth creation as well. They are producers, so I suppose it's a mixed bag. But I think most importantly, you know, when you go to some, some sort of you know emerging markets, you know, they they really do need the hydrocarbons to basically emerge out of some of the you know some of the you know poverty that that, that, that exists in those organ in those countries. You know, and uh, and that's that's problematic. So therefore, you know, I really just I think it's just very. We need to understand that we just can't apply, if you like, a developed markets and European or US standards to the rest of the world on a unilateral basis. Yeah, I mean, and what do you make of things like the IEA report? I mean, obviously, Trafficker is a huge huge oil trader. I mean, when they're saying no new oil and gas developments, I mean, that's that's not realistic, is it? Look, I think over a long period of time, well, first of all, the IEA report is, is a long term. We're talking by 2050. Okay, yeah. So this is a marathon. It's not just a short term sprint. Um, but we do have to transition out of hydrocarbons uh, and we do have to do it uh, logically and sensibly. And, uh, and therefore, you know, I just uh, I think, you know, we're planning now for on a long term future basis. We have to go down that trajectory. But it's not here today and it's not here tomorrow. It's going to be a long term process that we have to amend our energy stack and energy mix. Okay. But um, just to go back to, to one of my previous points, you wouldn't rule out a spike in sort of energy prices if that investment doesn't come through. Correct. I think we can see, again, it's more to do with, you know, what is a sustainable price over a long period of time for the oil market? Now, what is the price required to incentivise capital, which is going to be more expensive, incentivise new production? Now, you are seeing the independent oil companies move you know, transition their business model to be, you know, if you like, broad-based energy companies. So we, but we need to ensure that we can supply oil when it's needed for a period of time. And what do you think that incentive price might be? Look, you know, seventy-five dollars is a, is a good price for oil now. I mean, people mm -hmm. are doing relatively well, but on a forward-looking basis, if the cost of capital increases, or if carbon prices increases, and we may see inflation as well, um, it may need to be higher. That also the governments might start to tax in different ways. So, you know, it does depend on other parameters. Uh, so I'm not I'm not here to forecast where the oil price is going to be in five years' sure. time. Yeah. It's really the incentivization of, uh, of, the, of the, the what price needs to incentivize new production. Okay, well, well, let's turn to the energy transition in a bit more depth. I mean, what part does a big commodity trader have to play in the energy transition? It's a, we're about supply chain management. So, you know, we have a very integral part to play. You know, as a business, we generate asset light so we can reorientate our business. We still trade, you know, you know, a significant volume of oil, currently in excess of 7 million barrels of physical oil a day. Uh, we're also um, providing the metals which are needed for the energy transition. We're a significant trader in copper. So supply chain management from sub-Saharan Africa or South America into the consuming regions of Europe into, into Asia. So therefore, and we need to do that in a very cost-effective manner. Then we're moving into the renewable space where we're looking at uh, you know, renewable energy uh, what are the new fuels going to be? The non-hydrocarbon fuels going to be? Um, what is what role can we play in carbon trading? We can provide. We are investing in these areas. We are developing new divisions to provide service to our customer base. So for me, it's a it's something which we can, if you like, tilt our business according to the demands of the industry and our customer base. And we are doing that very actively and on a you know a proactive basis. 
So you can invest in, in renewables and gas and power on one hand, but also, I mean, you've made an investment in Rosneft's Arctic oil project, Vostok Energy as well. So, I mean, you can sort of tilt either way, really, depending on where you see demand coming from. Correct. I mean, basically, you know, the, Vo the Vostok investment, you know, we're a long term, uh, we have a long term commercial re relationship with Rosneft. This is a very large field. Uh, as I said, we need oil for the future. It's it's a it's a it's a low sulfur fuel. Um, so it's and it's a, it's got a carbon footprint of 25 percent of normal conventional oil producers. And it's already producing at the moment anyway. And this is something which, you know, again, this oil will be needed for the energy transition at the same time. We have also have a partnership with IFM and we've established Nile Renewables, which is going to be investing in uh, or developing two gigawatts of solar, aeolian and battery storage. So, yes, we're investing in these areas as well. And I don't think it's a conflict at all. Basically, it's we're, we're managing our business through this transition. Yeah, I mean, I did want to ask that question about whether it is a conflict, whether on the one hand you can talk about investing in renewables, cutting your emissions and then at the same time sort of invest in a big Arctic project. Um, but you don't see I, any contradiction. I don't. I don't see a contradiction. I think you know. Basically, you know, we have to. We're a broad-based industry. We're involved in the in the in the oil and energy business, and we're involved in the minerals and metals business, and now we're involved in the renewables energy business. So therefore, you know, that is our footprint. So we, we my view is very much, and it's well supported by the management team, which which really understand you know the the energy transition, and they're very much uh, you know it's, it's something they're very impassioned by. But we've got it. We can't turn off the lights. Yeah. You know, you can't just start and stop. And so, therefore, I don't see any conflict or contradiction at all through the processes and the investments we're, we're, we're doing. But I mean, say, I mean, let's take renewables. I mean, what sort of proportion of it of your business do you think it could be, say, within a decade? Um, it's good that you mentioned a decade because I think to develop a business and being a, if you like, a, a global leader in a certain commodity or, or business sector takes ten years. Yeah. I very much believe it's going to be a very strong third pillar of our business, and I, I think it could be, you know, a, a significant PL contributor to our to our company, definitely, you know, within five years and definitely within ten years. I think this, and I should, would also add carbon to this as well, because I think this is going to be a massive area, and uh, and very looking forward to developing this this expertise in this business. Yeah, I mean, just on carbon, I mean, you, you say it's going to be a massive area. I mean, in what respect? I mean, is this the sort of the voluntary offset side of things that, you know, you can team up a, a carbon credit with a barrel of oil to make it sort of low carbon? I mean, is that where you'd see the growth coming from in this market? Or is it the more standardised sort of, you know, European trading mechanism that, that you see an opportunity well, in? Yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're sort of, you know, we're finding our path in this. And it is a very much... You know, a, a very new business, but you know, you have your, your regulated business yep. and you have your voluntary systems. I do think you're going to have to see some changes within the voluntary systems to have proper accreditation processes to in, and a regulation for these businesses to give them, you know, a, a, and, and to allow some degree of convergence to the regulated marketplace. What do we see? I, I think there's going to be a lot of services that we can provide. We've already done and provided zero carbon shipments mm -hmm. of condensate and NAFTA. Uh, in this area, we're getting a lot of inbound from our mining customers about uh, you know zero carbon shipments of metals. So it's you know and so therefore a combination of understanding your carbon footprint, which is we are trying to do as an organisation anyway, under our sort of you know, obviously scope one and two, but also scope three emissions, and then providing these services to the customers as they you know if you like to decarbonise the supply chain. And uh, given the, the sizable footprint we have as an organisation and the breadth of commodities, it can be applicable to all parts of our business. So, I mean, do you think carbon credits can help secure a future for, for crude oil, LNG shipments, uh, etc.? I think actually to sort of have a zero carbon oil uh, is going to be challenging. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, uh, but I think uh, to do zero carbon supply chains is a different matter. Yeah. We've got to, we have to look at other sort of systems for sort of further reducing the carbon footprint of, of oil and other hydrocarbon uh, businesses. But, um, but it's going to be, a, you know, it will be an important part, particularly on the supply chain side. In the minerals and metal side, it's going to be equally important, more important, simply because obviously it's a, uh, I think there's more capacity to move the needle for those particular businesses. Yeah, and what do you see at Traffic Euro as the fuels of the future? I mean, is it hydrogen we should be focusing on, or is it green ammonia, uh, sustainable aviation fuel, renewable diesel? What, what should 
what is the fuel of the future for you? Personally, I think there's going to be a big mix. I don't think you can singularly say there's going to be one particular fuel or the other. Uh, that being said, uh, we are very, for, uh, on non hydrocarbon fuels, we're very much focused to the hydrogen based fuels and ammonia for mobility. From an ammonia point of view, you know, we have a relationship with, with, with MAN uh, where we're developing a, uh, you know, an ammonia based uh, marine uh, shipping engine, um, which hopefully will be actually sort of uh, finalised by 2024. Um, so, and we think, uh, and we've also got a joint venture with Yara in terms of the bunker inside of the business for, for, uh, for ammonia shipping, um, or mar uh, sorry, marine-based fuels. Mm -hmm. And also from a hydrogen point of view, you know, I think for on-land mobility, we've invested here in a company in Switzerland, which is vertically integrated, you know, reducing green hydrogen and all the way through managing, you know, hydrogen fuel cell trucks. Uh, which is providing logistical service for supermarket chains, and we want to replicate that uh, across Europe and other locations. So, quite frankly, you know, I think there's you know, there's a lot to do in this area. All the technology isn't quite there. A lot of investments are made, but uh, it's a very exciting area and one which we're very committed to. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the technology is not there, but it's certainly coming along quite quickly in areas like ammonia and hydrogen. But the infrastructure mm -hmm. also needs to come as well, doesn't it? I mean, how is how is that going to to emerge? I mean, we need government backing, don't we? Incentives, sort of regulation it's in a, order. Yeah, look, it's a huge... I mean, I think, look, technologically wise, it could be done, but uh, the fact is there's a huge amount of capital expenditure in terms of, you know, piping hydrogen, like the pipelines are there. The electrolyzers required to convert, you know, renewable energy, uh, you know, into hydrogen. Uh, then the conversion to ammonia. So there really is a lot of technology, a, a huge amount of capital expenditure. But then again, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, Europe is starting to push very hard. There's a lot of exciting projects that, you know, under consideration at the moment. Uh, and I think, uh, it, you know, as I said, it's a very exciting area to be involved with. So we could expect more more ventures, more more investments in in those sort of areas from you going forward. Yes, correct. And you know, working with partners, finding people which we can work with in these particular areas with certain competencies or complementary competencies, uh, the partnership model works very well for these type of investments. Okay. Now, one of the things that sets Trafigura apart from some of its peers is your metals and minerals business, which is obviously quite big. Um, and, you know, the shift, as we said, to, to clean energy is going to require a, a, lot of, a lot of metal, copper, nickel, cobalt, uh, et cetera. I mean, the, the World Bank is saying that we might need over three billion tonnes of, of, of new metal to, to achieve the two degree C future. But um, where, where's all this copper, cobalt going to come from? I mean, is the world going to be able to produce enough of it to hit these to hit these targets, do you think? You're right. In terms of renewable, if you like, energy transition, you're using five times as much copper in an in a electrical vehicle as you do with a sort of a typical internal combustion engine uh, run vehicle. Uh, the, all the grid work, there's a huge amount of copper required, but also just metal intensive, intensity is, 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 is going to be enormous as we construct the infrastructure for this transition. Um, we forecast, you know, we forecast demand to increase effectively. I think it's by, uh, you know, 10 million tons uh, by the end of the decade, which is, and it's currently, you know, it's a 30 million ton. It will be a 30 million ton market, so it's quite a significant mm. increase. Yet we've only got supply in our forecast by about five million tons. So we've got significant deficits on a forward-looking basis. So therefore, what do we need to to sort of address this problem? And we've been, we have been sort of, if you like, discussing this with various. Uh, bodies and uh, administrations around the world. You know, we price can be one incentive to, to increase the supply, but the issue is it takes a minimum of five and normally 10, even 10 to 15 years to develop a new main operation. So what we need to try and do is, if you like, speed up that process uh, without, you know, without reducing to our environmental impact to studies and all the, all the proper, proper things that you need to do to develop something responsibly. But, uh, you know, we need to actually be far more efficient in developing new resources. Yeah, but the problem is, I mean, it seems that every big new mine that um, is proposed comes up against some sort of opposition from, from local communities or campaigners that, you know, slows the process down more and more and more. That is the issue. And uh, unless we address that, we're going to have a serious problem because copper prices can go significantly higher. You will see some sort of replacement of maybe on other materials and scrap metal, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if we want to electrify, we need copper. So therefore, we're going to have to find a solution to the problem. But do you think and policy... price, is, price isn't the solution, is the only solution. Yeah, but do you think policymakers are aware of this? Actually, increasing, 
I think they're increasingly aware. The sort of dialogue we've been having, people are starting to understand the complexity of the problem and the issues around the supply chain for these, these, these metals which are needed for the transition. And so, therefore, you know, they are becoming aware. They just necessarily, don't necessarily have the solution yet, but they're becoming increasingly aware of the situation. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, you're sort of making some some moves in the battery supply chain. I mean, you sort of helped with the the buyout of, of Vale's New Caledonian nickel mine. Goro uh, was one example. What you're doing in the DRC with artisanal supply. Um, I mean, from the customers you're talking to, are they concerned that you know China Inc. as it were has sort of cornered the market for for battery materials, and they are starting to worry about their supply chains, where you know a Western car maker is going to get its material from? Are those fears sort of coming through for you? Not really. I mean, okay, China has a significant portion of the manufacturing of batteries at mm. the moment, yet they've also got the, the, the largest number of electrical vehicles on the road, so therefore that's understandable. In their own country, I think they have something like 5% of the raw materials that, that, that they need, and they've obviously, through their offshore acquisitions, maybe have something in the region of 30%. So therefore, there's still a lot of, they, they might have the manufacturing capacity, but not necessarily the, the supply chain of the raw materials for that. We are seeing significant changes within Europe and, and the US where people are looking to develop you know, battery manufacturing uh, centres uh, within, within trading regions. So therefore, I think you'll see the dynamics changing, particularly as we're sort of more and more electrical vehicles and uh, are being, uh, you know, are being registered on the roads and being manufactured in these areas. So I don't see that being a particular problem. When in relation to some of the metals that you mentioned, nickel, um, yes, you know we've invested. We, we we saw the need for these type of materials. Nickel is a very important ingredient in the battery in the manufacturing of, of batteries for EVs and industrial purposes. And so, therefore, you know we will be a significant supplier of those to the international marketplace. And in cobalt, uh, we have a we have a, a joint venture with the with the. Uh, the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, this is where we're you know, providing uh, sustainable um, jobs for artisanal miners which are extracting uh, cobalt. Uh, it's regulated. Uh, they're getting proper market prices. It's been, uh, you know, we've got uh, supervisory um, processes by NGOs to make sure it's all done properly and correctly. And this is providing livelihood to hundreds of thousands of people. It's also a significant supplier of cobalt to the world. So this responsible resourcing initiative is something which the world needs and it creates, if you like, employment you know, for the local people in, a, as I said, in a responsible manner. So it's, it's critical that this is, these, these processes take place and these supply chains are in existence. OK, we're running short on time, unfortunately, but just a few more questions I'd like to get through. Um, Thermal coal, I mean, it is probably the most hated commodity out there. Um, yet, I mean, we've seen reports that you're potentially interested in creating sort of a vehicle, almost a bad bank for sort of coal assets that are unwanted by the majors. Can, can you sort of tell us a bit more about that? I mean, is that a venture you are interested in getting involved in? Well, I think I can't tell too many details because it's still under concept. But uh, you know, coal is still, you know, we're in this transition. Coal is still, you know, it's just, you know in, produces the energy required in some of the emerging markets in India and other locations. Uh, we recognise that coal long term you know, is not a commodity of the future, but you know, to, again, to transition, we have to do this in a way. We're looking, quite frankly, at a, at a private uh, public partnership where we can wind down a coal industry uh, by 2040 leaving 70% of the reserves in the ground and ensuring, uh, you know, we get investors into a vehicle and ensuring we have a, 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 a fund overseeing this as well to, to provide sustainability and jobs for the people which are left behind as you close down industry and ensure the mines can be closed down properly. So this is something, it's a concept we're working on at the moment, um, but again, it's trying to manage a transition. You know, it's not trying to be opportunistic around something because I think you've seen some people sort of getting out of an industry trying to sort of do, you know, extricate them from, from, from a sector, and yet the business is still there. And I think we've got to try and do, have a long-term sustainable solution to this, to this industry. OK. Now, last but not least, you released uh, half-year figures last week, and they were uh, a record, really. Um, I just you know, sort of $2 billion of, of net income in the half-year, never mind the full year. I was just wondering if you could tell us how you did it. Look, it's, it's been a, look, a very pleasing set of results uh, for the company, uh, following on from a strong year of last year. What we're seeing is, you know, it's really a very strong performance across our entire commercial trading division. You know, each book, each centre has really performed very well. We have increased volumes, got a very, you know, I'd say a highly skilled 
you know, dedicated teams running the business and uh, and very happy with what they've been able to achieve. And our industrial asset base is turning around. So it's, a, you know, a very, a, as you say, a very strong set of results, very pleasing set of results. And uh, but it's reflective of, I think, you know, the position we have in the marketplace. So you think you've taken market share? I think we have taken some market share. But again, as I mentioned before, had a lot of that's to do with managing market volatility servicing customers, being able to have the working capital and a higher price regime to ensure that you, you can you know, provide the services which, you, which, you, which your business is designed to do. So, uh, yes, we've taken a bit of market share. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, personally, I, I thought that last year might be the high watermark for the industry in terms of profitability, yet these conditions, decent trading conditions have continued. I think it's, uh, we'll have to see how others perform. I can't comment on other businesses, but from our perspective, I see a great opportunity set on a forward-looking basis. The existing businesses are poor fit for all well. We've talked about sort of the renewable space. We've talked about carbon trading. These are very exciting new businesses, which which fit very well into our existing platform. And then I think over a period of time, you know, I'd like to think we'll excel in those areas. Yeah, and overlaying it all, we've got the long-term prospect of a, of a super cycle, which, I mean, you can, you can see, as, as we said at the start of this conversation. Yes, I think, you know, sustained higher price regime for a period of time as part of we move, this, move through this energy transition. And again, this is not just a one or two year sort of phenomenon. To me, this is for over the next decade or so. So therefore, very important. And, uh, and you know, I think we're pretty well positioned for it. Well, sadly, we're going to have to bring this conversation to an end. I think we could have continued much longer. But thank you very much, Jeremy, for, for talking to us today and, and giving us a, a great overview of yeah, how you see the energy transition and a, com and a commodity trader fitting into it. So uh, thank you very much. Pleasure, Neil. Thanks very much.